he did some things, but he could never really do it. So what do you have in his theory? You really have, you're dealing with characters. Mm -hmm. Now I should say, so I mean, we know from Frobenius and Dedekind, who are the founders of representation theory, how important characters are. Now, in this situation, there are, as one discovered much later, there are stable characters and unstable characters. So this, the analysis is, are there are functions that are invariant under conjugation or invariant under conjugation over the algebraic closure. These are, are subjects that are quite different. I mean, they're not quite different, they're the same, but they, you, need, you need to know the first theory, which is the ordinary theory, before you come to the second. Now, I don't know, the relation between them is known by, as with, by the word endoscopy. Now, a couple of years ago, in this room, someone gave a talk on endoscopy. Endoscopy is a very interesting subject. By the way, someone gave a talk on endoscopy, which was much more convincing this year. But a couple of years ago, someone gave a talk on endoscopy. And he got up and he started to talk, cited this paper, that paper, the other paper. And I really became more and more indignant because he never cited a paper in which endoscopy appeared. He cited a long list of papers in all of which endoscopy played no role. And I, so if I understand, but what are you doing? I, I grew, I was indignant and I probably didn't succeed in hiding my indignation. I just asked him what he was doing and given any of the relevant papers. And he didn't seem to know what to say. And after I've thought about it, after, I don't think that man had any idea what endoscopy was. I, I just, it's a very peculiar situation. And I just point out, you have to be careful when the word endoscopy is used. Um, but in the harmonic analysis that you want, that in which the L group plays a heavy structural role, you have to pass beyond the unstable stage with the use of endoscopy. And this we can, we can do in principle in general, but in fact, it's hard. It's why you need the fundamental lemma. Um, so it's a stable theory. And suppose we have two groups, G. So as I say, in representation theory for non-compact groups, the situation is difficult. There's a tempered representation on the analogy of tempered characters in uh, toward the line in theory, Schwartz's theory, and plays a role in Harris Chandra's theory. And then there are after that larger and larger categories of representations some of which play a role in automorphic forms, some don't. And uh, locally, as you pass through these various larger classes, you need a, 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 diff a slightly different kind of punctuality. Uh, punctuality. For example, to those who know the theory, Arthur's SL2 plays a role. All right. So this said, let's think locally only of temperate representations. Now, if we have one group G, so in some sense, the representations, the L group are such that its representations parametrize, or rather representations of something rather into it, parametrize the, the tempered representations at least of G. So you might like to think, and if we have a, a G and an H, the HL, then the, the representa irreducible representations are parametrized by a mapping of something into those groups. Um, they group. Now, if I may say so, you did us a disservice. I mean, uh, there is, a, we really, there's something called the Vade de Lean group, which is the right thing. The, I mean, you need something different. And it's what you need that's different, in my view, is you need SL2C cross the ordinary Vey group. And I would much, you could, I, that would be a much better choice, in my view, of a Vey group. 
Big guy. I understand. Okay. So then we give it another name, right? If you don't, if you don't like it, let's call it the thick and vague group. It's a, it, it preserves semi-simple uh, categories. Hmm? Objects are semi-simple. But this, it's not so important. The thing is that the parameter here of the thing is a representation of this group, locally of this group into HL to GL. And that means there's a functorial property if I have some representation here, I get something else here, which have no other relation to each other. I mean, they, 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 one is determined by a map here, other is determined by a map here. So if I have such an arrow, then I have, whenever I have something here, I have something here. And that's what you want to prove, and that statement has to be proved. It's not the functoriality, which is not a real functoriality in the sense it doesn't follow from general principles, it has to be established. And that's a major problem, and that's a problem about characters. Now, so characters are really central functions on the group, and what you want to do is to transform them from, from H to G. You want to have some rule for transforming characters from H to G, that's how it looks. Now. Huh? This is the, well, this is for the unstable, too, it's a story. But uh, let's think of it as stable. Hmm? So we're thinking of stable characters. That's because, I mean, the, the, uh, then it's a matter of conjugacy classes. You don't have, hmm? So it's the theory we want now is a stable theory. Hmm? We, uh, we'd never work from now on out of the stable theory. Um, so over the reals, we're dealing with characters where, they're stably invariant, so they have an easy kind of invariance. And of course, so these are functions on the classes. Now, they're functions which satisfy an algebraic equation. So it's some sort of uh, D module. Now, it's a little bit different because things are defined over reals. The groups are, are real groups. So the D modules look a little bit different than if they were, we're dealing with complex situation, but it's the usual kind of eigenvalue problem. It's complicated by the fact, complicated by the fact that there are jumps. There are places where these equations are singular, and you have to know what to do across the boundary. Now, harris chandras theory says, well, for real groups, the characters have to satisfy certain differential equations. harris chandras discovered that they need to be jumps. And he analyzed these jumps, and then he created a theory. Uh, it was a lifetime's work, and uh, discovered what all the tempered characters were. So he had a complete theory of harmonic analysis. Now, this theory does not exist for piadic groups, and no one, I think, has made a, set of, a real attempt to find it. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of work done, and we know a lot of things, but a coherent general theory is, uh, is not available. But what are we beginning to see? Uh, you don't, if you read, and people, I guess, are beginning to read, say, the papers of Alsperger about relation between orbital integrals on a group, orbital integrals on a Lie algebra, and it's a very complicated theory, especially for piadic groups. And at the same time, they have an altogether, they know more and more, because of Go and others, the relation between perverse sheaves and orbital integrals. And of course, they ready, you know the relation between perverse sheaves and, uh, and D modules. So one can imagine, I mean, I can imagine anyhow, uh, not everyone perhaps will want to imagine it, but that if you just go and look, you just look long enough, you keep in mind I'm dealing with D modules, I'm dealing with perverse sheaves I'm dealing with, hmm? conjugacy class, and I have harris chandras theory as a base, then I can do the theory for also piadic. I think one has to do this. I mean, there, there is no getting around the need for a real local theory, if you'll pardon the use of the word. And, and, but, but I think that it must be that you just start to amass the information, look at what people have done, and so on. You begin to see 
you know, what the perverse sheaves have and what the relations they perverse, perverse sheaves are to uh, Shalikas, uh, Aston thought it formulas, and so on. But we need it. Now, let me just tell you what that's going to give. You see, it's going to give us, we're going to be able to, we have, let's use the word stable for a stable, for a stable character. And we, if it will want to, So what functoriality should offer, and in particular, at least for tempered characters, is a way of assigning uh, to each stable tempered character of H, a stable temper, tempered character of G, when there was an arrow like this, and associated to an arrow like that. So this would be phi. And just as with endoscopy, that should then you see there'll be a dual map back because these, you should think of these as characters are linear function, are linear forms on functions. So the dual map would be a map from F from a function on G to a function on H. Now, this is as with endoscopy, you don't have a map from functions back to functions, you have this function is given, there are a large class of functions whose orbital integrals are related to the orbital integrals of fg. Now, it will not be, you will not have a, a map like that, which, or, which is so simple as for endoscopy. This will have to be such that, so these will be functions with compact support, have to be somehow determined by the orbital integrals, and the this stable character applied to the image FH will have to be the transfer of the, that stable character. So this is the transfer of this at FG. So this is what you want. Now, there's, uh, there's a little paper here, singular, singularity transfer, where I just show what that means for periodic groups for SL2. Hmm? as you can do it on the basis of the known formulas. I, I, I mentioned to Shellstad, who was responsible for the endoscopy theory for real groups, if this, this kind of thing might be, the existence of this kind of thing might be uh, shown for the reals at least. We can't do it over Paddock, but for the reals, and she seems to be optimistic, but so far as I know it hasn't done. In any case, she's here, if you can catch her before she leaves. But, Huh? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the only interesting case. It's not the only interesting case. Another interesting case would be SL2 and a point. I, this, is, this is a very, in, I, I point out that this is a very interesting map in the case that H is the trivial group, because the L group is, has the Galois groups in it. So we're really picking up all the represent, if H is the trivial group, then we're looking at representations associated to finite maps, maps of finite Galois group. But in principle, the exercise for SL2 is for the case when H is a torus. Hmm? All right, so that is one of the things. So the existence of this local transfer from FG to FH1 needs to do it periodically. We'll come back to that later. I, I, uh, so that's one element that we'll need. So we're still worrying about, we understand what functoriality is, it, a little that it's the, it's the attachment to characters of H, characters of G in those, those circumstances. So that means, you see, think of the case that you have a representation, for example, of some group then for every linear representation of the L group, so every certain GLN, you have another representation of GLN. Um, so that this is very much, I, one doesn't like to speak of Tanakhian categories, especially those of us who know nothing about Tanakhian categories, but in principle, it's the same sort of, the same sort of thing. One has an object and it's, it's the things associated to it are, rep, are representations of GLN, and for each representation of the, 
of this group, hmm, in GLN, you have something, namely. So these, uh, these, uh, represent, these representations of GLN, or globally these automorphic forms for GLN, are functioning like the vector spaces of a Tanakhian category. I say this because it is ultimately best to think that dealing with a Tanakhian category of some sort. And, and the thing is that, you see, you may make a mistake when, you, when you're looking at an object. You may take something that belongs to H and you blow it out to all the GLNs, but it may come from something smaller. It may come from another map like that. So you won't recognize it immediately uh, as, uh, as something coming from H, or because it is, doesn't come from H, it comes from something smaller. All right. So it's this local theory one needs, and I says, I say, I think there's a certain amount of material available enough that one could seriously begin. I, it's certainly not a project for a year or two, and I don't think it's a project for someone over 70 either. He doesn't. He doesn't. It could really be a not continuous 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 You know, if you look at the case of SL2, it's, it's not trivial in the sense that you, you need to know something about the characters, but then you see it appearing. It's true in that case, okay. So whether it's true in general is something else, but I don't see, it just, it just has to be so, I think. And, and for the one case where we can manage it, it's true for spherical functions, but that's kind of a trivial situation. It's also true for functions with support on the compact tori. Huh? So it, 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 it involves, I don't think you could check it between now and next week for SL2. But if you look at the calculations, at least, they, it took me a long time to sort out the calculations. Huh? It's, not, it's not a major task, but it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience, I found, for just to make the necessary calculations for SL2 with the, with the, with the characters in hand. All right. So I'm actually, so this is a local thing, really, and that would give us, we're really asking that we already established functoriality locally. Now, the question is globally. Hmm? So, so, we want, the question is one of getting to global functoriality. So, when I, it's a kind of methodological problem. What I claim is, there's so much in functoriality that uh, it will tell you what to do if you look at it very carefully and listen uh, well as you can. Now, that reminds you, of course, that the purpose of functoriality was, or the origin, was the fact that one could associate, one had something global, namely an automorphic representation, then one can associate L functions to it, where rho is a representation, so an ordinary complex representation of the group GL, which is a, a complex group. So these things are there. By the way, the third theory, the geometric theory, doesn't have them. But these things are there. They play a big role in the subject. And of course, the subject plays a big role for them, because from functoriality follows Immediately, so the uh, analytic continuation of these functions, which define it first in a half plane, and it also the um, Selberg Ramanujan conjecture. And also, let me say this, I, I, it isn't, it's so, what's it called? Things of Sato tape type. Let me just explain this a minute. Not, of course, for uh, Hasse-Weiss eta function, so let me stress this, not for Hasse-Weiss 
zeta functions, but for automorphic L functions. So what uh, global functoriality gives is analytic continuation, Selberg Ramanujan, and Satwa Tate for automorphic L functions. Um, but it doesn't give you anything for Hasse-Vey zeta functions. Now, what? No, no. I mean that, that won't be true. It, it will give you. I mean the selberg ramanujan conjecture doesn't conjecture anything for those representations for which it's false. <laughs> uh, uh, let me go on. I, 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 Huh? Uh, let me go on. I mean, and then you'll see. It, it, uh, we know what we want, right? We know we want a classification along the lines of Arthur. And for those things for which there's no SL2, hmm, then it's true. we want the Ramanujan conjecture to be true. So that's what it's supposed to give. So I say, this is out of the question for the moment. So we want to study D. Now, it's not a principle that everybody has, but I think it's a good principle when you're doing mathematics. If you think A, B, C, and D are true, then see what a consequences A, B, C, and D have, and then try to prove some of the consequences, or perhaps even try and prove A, B, C, and D by fiddling with the consequences. Now, this is what we want to do here. We want to, we want, this, uh, implicit here is, implicit here is a classification, I see it, uh, namely that every automorphic representation comes from something which is really something of SL2 type and something of Ramanujan type by mixing them together. And uh, that, it's, the, the zeta functions or L functions behave correspondingly. So um, every we think we want to act that way and see where it leads us. We're looking for statements that we can prove, but we're arriving at them on the basis of what we think is true. I think it's a perfectly reasonable way to proceed. So we have by the, the structure that. We have really a map. Every some every automorphic form comes some in the following way, namely, it comes from an embedding of SL two into GL, so an automorphic form here. So this is something which goes in. It can be the trivial representation of SL two. It can be the principal one or something in between. And um, then, then HL is just lies in the centralizer of that. And now, you see, as I said, there are some automorphic, we want this automorphic form coming from H not to come from anything smaller. And we can tell, we know how to recognize them. How do we recognize, we know in principle, we recognize them by the fact so those things that come from this on H, we know so this for any S pi, so pi H, and the L function doesn't depend on the stable class, so it doesn't matter. And, and rho, where rho is a representative, so it's an L function on H. Those things which don't have any SL2 factor and which really belong to H, they are such that these L functions, so rho H irreducible, that these L functions do not have a pole. They, first of all, they can be continued up to S equal 1 and do not have a pole at S equal 1 unless rho H is trivial. I mean, that's what I think everyone who reflected on the matter agrees. So we want to see what we can build out of it. Hmm? All right. So let's, let's see what we can build. Now, what then we want to do we want to take a sum over all pi stable. So we're assuming that we need the stable trace formula, so we need endoscopy. And 
let's fudge a little. So all pi stable, and so we're assuming that pi stable, each pi stable, corresponds to this S, an SL2 cross HL into GL. So this is the sum for, for G. So basically, and, and we've, the pi's are really, are, are uh, square integrable. They're in the discrete series globally. We have that. That's how we are. They may come with multiplicity. So we have to be careful. I'll tell you where, we know, per, I mean, it's pretty clear where the multiplicity comes from. And then we want to put in, we're going to take the trace of pi of f. This is a function on g. So fg, fg is a product over v of fgv. F, and uh, we choose a finite set of places. And at those places, we agree we're going to take this, we're going to fix this for the moment. We're just going to keep it that the fi it's, a, it's one finite set of places, it's arbitrary, and we're going to keep until the very last stages of our argument, Fv, which is a function of the compact support, open at those places. We can, because then at the end we'll be able to fiddle around with the Fv's and cut ourselves down to one pi, all right? But then we'll put in the other, so this will be, this will be the product over V and S, trace of pi V, we should put stable, FGV. So this is something we keep free to the end. What do we put in here? We put in something here, so that this gives the partial L function, Ls, uh, Ls pi, so the partial L function, and one of these representations rho of GL. So I have, I've assumed you know how to define these things. Uh, that, that's not fair for everyone, but they can be defined fairly easily. So we put this, or well, it's actually uh, better to put minus, you know, there's a question, but I think it's fair to put that. So we put in, we choose Fg outside of V, so that it gives us the logarithmic derivative of the, uh, of the partial L functions. Because they, of course, behave as far as poles at s equal 1 the way we want. Hmm? So there we have this. And this is going to be something which will work at first for s large. Hmm? Very much greater than 0. Or 1, if you like. Now, what we want to do is we want to look at those, at the behavior, uh, see if we can't understand this as S approaches 1, all right? Now we have to be careful because S approaches 1 is the typical thing for which there's no SL2. Now there's no SL2 factor. So we can expect that these things will have a pole, have a pole or no pole at, at S equal 1. Hmm? And exactly, so here, let's look at this. Uh, it behaves, so suppose this is, this is a pi g. Now suppose it comes from a pi h. In other words, we have this picture in our mind that, that every pi g comes from such a picture. All right? So what does that imply about this? So it comes from a pi h. That means that the first thing to do is to, is to look at this. This is the representation of GL to see what it does when restricted to HL. If it doesn't contain the trivial representation, let's forget about the SL2 factor, if it doesn't contain the trivial representation, then there's no pull. I mean, just we can think. So um, it, what we'll, the, the influence on this will be a question of whether rho G has rho g composed with phi, which is a sum of, which is a direct sum of rho, let's say i of h, hmm? has a pole. Hmm? Then, then we'll see. And then, so this is something which is uniform for all those representations which come from the given h. It's uniform. So there'll be a sum here. There'll be a second factor here, which comes from the SL2 part. 
Now, what will the, that other factor will take the whatever poles are coming from H and spread them out so that some will be quite spread out and we'll meet them first. We know very well because that's the function of the SL2. It just takes the pole and moves it one half, three halves, five halves, so to the right and to the left. So in particular, if this is the representation, if pi h is the one which comes from where h is trivial and SL2 is the standard rep representation, or not, I mean, what's it called? The, the biggest SL2, where the SL2 is, I mean, just very big. If you have an a, a SL2 embedded to a group, there's one for which its embedding is not, uh, it's not can't be factored. It's a principle. Principle. That really spreads it out. That's where you're going to see the first pole. In other words, we take this sum and, and we look at it and we move S over. We move S over to 1. We want to get to 1. And, uh, but because of this SL2 factor, some things will pop up first. We'll see the pole first. And, and so we, we see the pole first, we take them into account. Now, that's why I find it very nice, I'll come to it later, but that for the principal unipotent, one sees in this paper with Frankel and Go, that happening for the, you see. You see why it's there. We haven't discussed yet the problem of how we can, how we can possibly analyze analytic behavior. Um, the, the thing is that I point out to those of you who are younger and even to those of you who are older, that the trace formula, elegant as it is, has been not very useful as an analytic tool. It's been useful with endoscopy, but there you had identities. As a tool for studying asymptotic behavior, I think it has not been very effective. Uh, you can quote, huh? You take except well, it depends what you want. In my experience, uh, it hasn't been effective. Now, uh, the what what one gets, huh? Huh? All right, not as effective as you like. Um, what I want to say is, I think I mean that's one thing that Go gave us with the with the Hitchin vibration. He didn't give he gave us the you know, the Hitchin map for Lie algebras, but there's, uh, if you look at it, there's something similar, similar parameterization for, for the group. And it's a parameterization, I find it very striking. I understand it, not, not everyone finds it so striking, but it gives you the parameterization of conjugacy classes in the, in the group, as a vector space, if the group is semi-simple thing. Now, this is a remarkable fact because it allows you to use Poisson summation. It should be regarded as a mortal sin to confound Poisson summation with the Selberg trace formula. Poisson summation really is an effective tool for calculating asymptotic behavior. And it gives it to you, and in particular, the first thing you see, as I said, is that the contribution from the from the representation pi for which this uh, SL2 part is principal, just pops right up as a contribution from zero. Now, for those of you, I was thinking about it on the way over. The walk is long enough that one can think of one or two things. I'd like to propose the following case. I know, it didn't occur to me before. Think of the case of G equals G equals SL3, and the SL2 being that, and then, see, the image of H has the line, the centralizer of the image of the SL2, and here the image is abelian. So an interesting question is, so in that case, in other words, I think that the, uh, the uh, Those, I, I, I'm not sure, maybe you don't get anything, but I was just thinking, well, then the centralizer is very small, and I, I don't know whether it's reasonable to think 
that you could see it. I mean, you're not going to have any problem with the trace formula on the centralized on H itself because it has to be abelian. So is there anything, are there interesting re re representations that look like that, which correspond to the SL2 like that, and then the image of, uh, and if they are, you can see them. I, I, it's only a thought on the way over, and I mentioned it. If someone has some ideas, you, it, because it has an, this observation that for the principal part, you really see things has, no, has not been pushed uh, further. All right. So you see, so what you see is that if you can study the analytic behavior, the asymptotic behavior of the trace formulas, we, we have this, but now we're going to express it by trace formula. which, as I said, can then be combined with the Poisson summation formula. And the question is, can one then use that to study the asymptotic behavior of this? Hmm? Getting rid of the, for SL2, for example, you only have the one really bad term. And then you want to, you want to get all the way into S equal one hmm, with the rest. This is uh, no easy matter. Uh, there, there's someone in the room who's trying that. It's a critical test. Uh, whether if you can do something for SL2 in some special cases. And uh, it was a test which, as far as I can tell from conversations with the gentleman involved, is that uh, it's progressing well. But it's, it's by no means clear. You get, in, get very large and very messy sums. That's why it just occurred to me on the way down that this would be this particular case would be a, a second case that one could look at and uh, try. All right, so that's, you see, what, what I've said is that there are problems. One needs this local theory. One needs an analysis here at this level of this Fourier, trans, Fourier uh, plus, uh, trace formula then uh, Poisson summation. It's not, it's by no means easy. So if you're a skeptical nature, you can be skeptical. But uh, you know, someone, I mean, I know people who are, I've heard of people, they've never confessed to me, you were skeptical, but it's a little bit like someone who's in the middle of the ocean and somebody throws him a rope and he says, if I hang on to it, it might break. I, Okay, now, so, so here's the situation, you see, on, on the one hand, we can get a hold of this asymptotic behavior, I mean, in principle, we can get a hold of it. On the other hand, we, th we, think, it, we think it's the sum over, over these, these things. So if, and in, in those things, when we, when we re replace Fg by Fh, hmm? so we think something which, that we have coming from the trace formula is equal to a sum over this, right? Hmm? So, in principle, the trace, and we, we're, we're, not, we're not interested in most, in most of it. We're going to take S going to 1, and that means, for example, we're going to drop those things which are associated to G, because they're, hmm? so we're, G himself is not going to, it's going to give us one side, but not the other side. So there'll be, the other side will be a sum over H. Sum over H, which will be expressed in terms of F, H and, and FG, and uh, so it will be the k same kind of sum, and then we'll have we'll have contributions from the SL2 and then contributions from these HL. And it'll be a little bit messy because some things are going to come from several HL. But so for the SL2, as I said, we know that we're going to have to peel them off step at a time. First the principal one, and then the bigger and bigger until we get down and there's no SL2 left. Because the, 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 and then the, it's going to be What's left, and we'll, we'll have to peel it 
from this side, we'll have to peel it from this side, and what is left should have its first poles at s equal 1, when we want to know its poles. We don't care about uh, where there are no poles. So we have simple poles because the logarithmic derivative. And uh, that's that. Now, then, wh then what do we need? OK, I said 1, 2. All right, now, and then you see this h comes, we have l of s. This is just a parameter, pi sub h, stable, and then rho. But it will really be rho was equal to summation rho, rho h i. Now, let's, let's forget the SL2 for now. And then the only things that matter then are those rho for which some of these rho hi's are trivial. Hmm? Are, are, and, and so we, we may have several of them. And, but then if we do, then this factor, you can say I, I know it by induction or something, is just equal to the multiplicity of the trivial representation here divided by uh, s minus 1, say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a logarithmic derivative, because I hope the right sign. So what you have to understand, and that's not an easy matter, you have to understand somehow the dimension data. You see, we're going to let, we're going to let rho vary, and then we're going, because the different, it's more or less, suppose it may even be proven, I think it's probably proven by, uh, uh, what, what are their names, uh, uh, Larson and Ping, that uh, these, these numbers, the number multiplicity of trivial representation of rho varies, determines the group up to isomorphism, not up to embedding, but up to isomorphism. As I see, as I said, experience suggests that the different kinds of embeddings give rise to multiplicity. Okay. Now, that doesn't look so bad, but then comes, I think, a really, so, so the last, and I think it's the hard part, we have to make the comparison. We have to make the comparison of whatever we have from the trace formula with this. This, in some sense, we presume to understand. All right? So we have to make the comparison. Now, what is the worst thing? What's the worst possible thing that can happen? The worst possible thing that can happen is that H is equal to 1. And then the HL is a Galois group. So, with, so it's a finite group. So we have those things which embed. So those representations, those automorphic forms, which are somehow of art and type. And then you need, so you see, we're going to get something from the trace formula for G, and we're going to get here something for each possible embedding, basically. So we're going to get, what we're going to get, we're going to be comparing, we're going to be comparing something coming from automorphic forms tomorrow, the, the space of, on which, auto, and the embeddings of Galois groups in G. Now you recall that when class field theory was, so to speak, done by, before, the, before Chevalier, this was the core of class field theory, a comparison of that sort, counting the number of cyclotomic extensions extensions on the one hand and counting something coming from ideals on the other. For those of you who have looked at class field theory before Chevalier, that's basically what you had. Now, you see, for you know how to count those subgroups uh, uh, that are, uh, that are, are sickly Galois groups, basically. You just count the number of solutions of equations like that. Hmm? Let's say L and a prime. 
One's going to have to do something similar here, but with more complex groups, with groups that uh, are uh, not abelian. And I suggest, I don't really suggest a way, but uh, I, I suggest in this paper, hmm, singularity, a transfer, a possible way of doing it. But I think it's, it's this last question, I mean, you, you have to be cautious. There's really some work to be done there. Some counting of two quite different things, that one of which we don't understand yet because we haven't got that far with the trace formula. The other is the question of counting somehow, because it's actually it's an algebraic variety after all, the number of the counting the number of points on an algebraic variety and somehow making the comparison. You don't want to, you're never going to be a measure count. But and, until you see it, I, I don't know. So but I, I describe it towards the end of this, of this paper on stabilities and transfer. And uh, I think it's the last and uh, maybe even the hardest point. But if everyone gets that far, in any case, that sort of speaks to the, the project. Now, uh, it's a project which, as you see, is independent of reciprocity. And, and I think it's not feasible in one year, two years, but over a very long period, I think it's something that is worthwhile keeping in mind. Now, uh, I think that's, a, that's my sermon. Uh, now, I was going to say just a little bit about reciprocity. All right. You see, I don't, I, I don't think I, I want to say very much because, in fact, uh, as I said, I don't have an idea. Reciprocity is, a, is kind of a motivic statement. We have seen here that automorphic forms look like a, a Tanakian category. And, and the statement is that this, that presumably, that what Grotendieck offers is a Tanakian category, which is something over Q, and this is a Tanakian Automorphic forms give something over C. When tensor with C, and with some modifications, because one has to take account of absolute values and so on of L functions, there will be some kind of correspondence between categories. But, and I think you have to formulate the statement that way. You have to formulate, I mean, it will be confirmed they'll have the same L functions, but you have to, to you see, but, and then here, here I, I don't, I mean, for the functoriality, I have a certain amount of confidence. But when, when you think, if it is a statement between, between two Tanakian categories, you have to understand the structure of both. And of course, the structure of the Tanakian category of motifs, or any kind of motivic category, demands over Q, it's, it's to say the algebraic variety is over Q or over some number of Q. You have to know the structure of that. And, it, I mean, and, and, and there are basic problems. I mean, they're, they're really Hodge conjecture and so on, they're sitting in there as minor stumbling blocks. But uh, I'd like to think that, uh, so you would only at first do worry about them over, over a number of fields. You wouldn't worry about them over C. And uh, it's conceivable, and I, I don't think anything can be promised, that it's one way to look at, say, the Hodge conjecture, which just, you know, has not uh, been uh, I mean, no one's made great inroads on the Hodge conjecture, but one should, one should reflect on the fact that that, that that obstacle is there. You don't really have a theorem unless you prove the Hodge conjecture. Now, that's, that's all I wanted to say is you could forget the last few remarks. Uh, the other thing I would have liked to talk about, because of course it's, it's quite interesting, is the case of the geometrical theory. And, and, but A, I've run out of time, and, and B, I, I don't have much to say. When you look at, I find, and this is a personal view, that when I look at the geometrical theory, it's really, it's really carelessly exposed everywhere. I mean, and uh, you can't, you, your feeling is, yes, you know, these very fantastic ideas must have something in them. I don't know how you feel. They must have something in them. But I cannot believe that there's any relation between the geometric theory and Fermions. I mean, I can believe there's a connection, but I don't think you, that you could need fermions, for example, that you could need supersymmetry. You know. There must be a theory in which all these things disappear, and you're left with, uh, it may be that people like Nadler and Ben Shvi and so on have ideas, but uh, it just, 
there's a, as I say, there's a carelessness of exposition on the one hand, so the things don't look quite right, and they left the, the, the representation theory behind. You can put the representation theory back in, and you, and you learn something by doing that. Anyhow, uh, I don't see any point in my comment beyond that. I comment, that, I comment on it in my notes, but uh, for what it's worth, but that's more an exercise for myself than anyone else. Well, thank you for listening. Yeah, I'm willing to take a few questions. It's a, it's a question. Yes. Well, that's.